Weird question here. How many times does King Saul meet David in the Bible? I know, I know what you're thinking. You can only meet someone once, right? Okay, okay. Uh, related question. What do we do when the Bible contradicts itself? Stick around. We'll talk about it. We're here to study the Bible. We're here to study the Bible. We're here. We're here to study the Bible. Might get us in trouble. Because we're being intentionally provocative with our intros. As readers, we're introduced to David through some stories in 1 Samuel chapter 16. The first story I really don't want to talk about. It's, it's the one where Samuel is sent by God to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite, David's dad, to anoint a new king. There's already a king on the throne. His name is Saul, but uh, God is displeased with Saul, and Samuel is to anoint a new king. Now, we also meet David's three oldest brothers. Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema. None of these guys uh, fit the bill for kingship. Also, the four other no-named brothers, David has seven brothers, according to uh, 1 Samuel, none of them fit, fit the bill. And it's David who isn't even in the room when Samuel is there checking out all these individuals. He's outside shepherding the flocks. He's the youngest. He's not very impressive. He's just kind of, everyone's surprised that he's anointed king. Now, the only thing that we need to know about this story is the family members, Jesse and then the three oldest brothers, and uh, and David is the youngest. And we also need to know that at the end, after David is anointed, that the spirit of the Lord is upon him. Some sort of phrasing uh, that would make you think that the Spirit is, is with David. Because as we pan over in the middle of chapter 16 back to Saul, it says that Saul begins to be tormented by evil spirits from the Lord. And that in and of itself is a video. It's not this video. I will tell you that this is a motif that's not isolated uh, in this story. Evil spirits do um, are sent out from God at different points in the Old Testament to do some, some crazy stuff, but we'll leave that off to the side for a moment. Now, in the ancient world, you can think of musicians as a form of magician in the sense that their playing was believed to have uh, these magical properties that could soothe evil spirits. So when Saul is able to diagnose what's going on, he says, I need a, a musician. I need someone to come and play the lyre for me. I need someone to come and play the lyre for me. And one of the servants says, I know a guy, I know a guy. I, hey, I know a guy. Listen, I've seen him. He's the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. He's awesome. He can play anything that you want. He has a lyre and he's the best player uh, that there is. He's like the Lin-Manuel Miranda of the ancient world. You should hear this guy. Not only does he play music, he writes really good content. He's written a ton of psalms. So Saul is like, this sounds really good. The servant uh, keeps going because this is important for our understanding of who David is. He says, he's a valiant fellow, a warrior, prudent in speech. He's a good looking guy and the Lord is always with him. Notice the description of David here does not match the story we've just heard about little poor young shepherd boy. This is a, this is a kid who's a valiant warrior. He's prudent in speech. He's cunning. He's sophisticated. He's eloquent. He's sharp. He's handsome. He's a good, he's a good looking guy. The Lord is with him and he can play the liar. All these things. Like it's not, he's a little poor shepherd boy. It's like David is uh, a guy that you want to be with you. When he shows up and begins to play the liar and Saul sees how, how good he is, it says that Saul loves him greatly. He makes David his armor bearer. That's important. And Saul eventually sends word to Jesse saying, I love this guy. He's way better than Lin-Manuel Miranda. He's, he's got to hang out here with me. I need him. The story concludes. And so when the spirit of God, the evil spirit of God was upon Saul, 
David would take up the lyre and play. I don't know if you've noticed, but whenever I say lyre, I have to do this. It's just part of the contract. David would take up the lyre and play and Saul would find relief. This is when David meets Saul. Except when we go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, the, the very next story, uh, it's, a, it's a popular one. It's the story of David and Goliath. You, you know the story, we're not gonna rehearse it here. Uh, the, the bullet points, it's a time of war and Israel is very scared of the Philistine army because their champion Goliath keeps coming out saying, if any of you come out and battle me and win, then we will submit to you. But if I beat whoever you send out, you must submit to us. Goliath, as we know, is also fairly tall, depending on which version of the Bible you read. Uh, the Greek Old Testament has him at six and a half feet. The Hebrew uh, Bible has him at nine and a half feet or so. Also, he's covered in armor. Interesting tidbit. The armor, uh, historically speaking, is from different eras. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, that's, that's part of it. So that, that's the story. And now when, when David shows up, it's like we as the reader have never heard of him. And Saul as the king has never been introduced to him. The, the way the story is written, it's like this is a completely new character. I mean, even right now, you already know who David's dad is. And if you were listening and paying attention, you already know who his three older brothers are. Yet in the story, it says in verse 12 of chapter 17, And David was the son of this Ephrathite man from Bethlehem in Judah, named, oh, let me guess, I, I bet it was Jesse, named Jesse. And Jesse had eight sons, and the three oldest who went to war were, let me guess, let me guess, it's Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema. Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema. And then it continues. And as for David, he was the youngest. And the three oldest had gone after Saul and David would go, uh, well, well, David would go, he would go back and forth between Saul and his dad's sheep. Yes, yes, that's what he did. Okay, okay, as readers, like that last line in particular, like you're throwing flags on the field. Who does that? So we're tr what you want us to believe, what you want us to believe, editor of the book of Samuel, is that in a time of war, the armor bearer of the king would spend time with the king bearing his arms and also going back to feed sheep. Okay, uh, and we're also to believe that in a time of war, when I would suppose that anxiety is at a maximum level and the evil spirits of Saul were present, we are to suppose that the magical musician would be like, time out boss, I gotta go feed the sheep. And he would go back and forth. We're to believe that, I got flags on the field. Okay, but let's, let's keep going with the story because it gets, better or worse. Uh, David, when he sees Goliath, he's, he's all indignant and he wants to fight him. And when Saul finds out, he says to David, you can't fight Goliath. You're just a kid. Goliath is a warrior. Now remember chapter 16, verse 18, when the servant is like, I got a guy, I got a guy. He's a valiant fellow. He's a warrior. He's prudent in speech. He's a good looking guy. And the Lord is with him. Remember that whole bit? It's like Saul doesn't know that and also doesn't even know who David is. And let's just play, play a game here, a little role playing. If you were David in this position and Saul, your boss, says to you, you're just a boy, you're just a kid, what would you say? How would you respond? Do you think you'd mention the fact that you were burying his arms previously? Uh, yeah, that seems to make sense, but not here. David says, no, 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 no. I'm not just a kid, don't, don't worry. I'm a shepherd boy. <laughs> Are we, what's going on here? And then finally, the weirdest bit of all, uh, you know how the story pans out, David, confronts Goliath, he's not wearing any armor, which is, is actually a, a tactic. Not everyone in war 
uh, would wear armor. There was also fleet-footed marksmen who used a slingshot. It's not a kid's toy. And David was sort of not playing against uh, Goliath according to, to the rules, but uh, let's, let's leave that to the side. David uh, snipes him in the face, cuts off his head, brings the head back to Saul, and Saul says to his chief officer, who is this guy? And you might think, well, that's probably just a rhetorical question, kind of like, who is this guy? <laughs> no, uh, he actually doesn't know. And Abner's like, by, by your lordship, Lord, I do not know. Uh, and then Saul says, well, go get the boy so we can talk to him and ask him. And then they do. And David comes in and Saul's like, who's dad? is yours. Well, I screwed that up, but you know, like, who's your dad? <laughs> and oh, this is strange because Saul has sent correspondence to David's dad, and, and we know who, who David's dad is. It's Jesse the Bethlehemite, and that's exactly what David says. Uh, Jesse, my dad is Jesse the Bethlehemite. Like, we don't know, and like, Saul doesn't know, and like, everybody else doesn't know. This is really, really, really strange. These two stories don't go together. They contradict each other. They don't sit there comfortably because they're asking all sorts of questions to one another. Which is why folks like Joel Baden, a Yale professor, says things like, it's easy enough to see why both of these stories, David as the magical musician and also David as uh, the, the efficient uh, player of the liar and the armor bearer of the king. That's, that's a cool story. And also the David who snipes Goliath in the face and chops off his head. That's a good story too. Both would be valuable to biblical authors. He continues, as we have already seen, both stories present David in a flattering light as a young man, faithful to both his king and his God. But both cannot be historically true for they contradict each other at almost every turn, according to Joel Baden. And he's not the only one. This is a pretty standard line in biblical scholarship, uh, at least critical biblical scholarship. Uh, so here's, here's what I'm gonna argue for over the course of some videos. First of all, it's good to know what's in our Bible. This is not like a, a, a deep seminary influenced reading of the Bible. This is just you're reading these stories and if you read them consecutively from 16 to 17, you should be able to say like, what? Why doesn't Saul know David? I mean, he's been playing the, the liar for him for an unknown amount of time. Why, what's happening here? That's the kind of stuff that, that has inspired critical scholarship. Uh, but it's, it's good for us to know what's in the Bible, maybe so that we can confront some of the ideas that we have uh, about the Bible. But more importantly, I would argue that this type of stuff should not concern us. The tension between these stories, I mean, most people would say that Samuel has been edited. Most people would say that, uh, especially as a, as a collection, the books of First and Second Samuel and uh, even beyond that, um, it's been edited and that probably you can see uh, evidence of an editor's hand in the bit where David is going back and forth. It's preposterous. It doesn't make any sense historically, but they're trying to ease the tension between these two stories. But they knew that they were there they knew that there was problems, but they still kept them because their understanding of what the Bible was allowed for those stories to stay there. So may maybe, maybe some of the things that we demand from our Bible, they're setting us off on the wrong foot when we actually open them up and read them and then have to explain away all of the things that are happening in the text. They, they, they might not be, uh, at least always, accurate representations of history. As Baden would say, both of these stories, they can't be true, but that's okay. It's still sacred scripture. And perhaps what we need to do is to adjust the lenses through which we are reading the Bible. I've seen people when faced with these sort of tensions, they kind of throw the whole thing away and, and leave. And that's not, that's not where I want you to go. People have known about this stuff for centuries and it's okay. I would posit the view that maybe our American understanding of what the Bible must be is putting us off on the wrong foot and what we need to do is adjust the expectations that we have and begin to ask what the Bible is wanting to say to us.
about David, about kingship, about any number of the things that are being addressed in this particular passage. If this kind of stuff is upsetting to you, I would encourage you to drop a comment below, shoot me a message. I'd love to have coffee with you, whether that's uh, if you're watching this after the pandemic, like in person, or if this is, um, you know, during the pandemic, we can Zoom, we can FaceTime, whatever. Feel free to ask any questions that you have about this. We're going to keep going. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about David and Goliath. And I would urge you, don't invite your Sunday school teachers because this one's going to sting a bit. But... It's okay if this means anything to you. I love Jesus. I love the Bible. I respect it. I've dedicated my entire life to studying it. And I'm still here. I know what's in it. I'm still here. In fact, you could even say that some of these discussions are the things that have kept me in the game. So, if you need hope... There is hope. If you need to pursue some of the questions that you have, drop me a line. I'd love to talk to you about it.